What is my no? Okay, I see a lot of people joining. I'll give everyone another few seconds to connect and make sure they're all listening. Make sure that, we're, yes, we're being recorded. Got it, under control. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this third and final session of the uh, Arch Talk, Arch Talk, Arch Talk. Not sure how, we, how you say it actually out loud. I've only ever typed it. Um, 2022 by Safe Cultural Heritage Group. Uh, this session is, oh, my name is Matilda Siebrecht as well, for those who didn't uh, catch me in session two. And today we are now going to be looking at digital media for culture, communication and education. And we have a lovely range of speakers all coming up. We're talking about what makes an online post great. We're looking at a review of digital activities for museum uh, participants, especially children. We're looking at how digital spaces have changed our approach to history and culture different kinds of museums and digital technologies and how you yourself can maybe try to start using digital uh, media for your own uh, heritage outreach. I'm going to start straight away because let's face it, you're not here to listen to me prattle on about the session. You're here to, uh, to listen to our wonderful speakers. And our first speaker is uh, Rebecca, and I apologize sincerely for mispronouncing any names in this one, Rebecca Jergax. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Rebecca. Uh, when you're here, you'll make a much better job of it than I did. Um, who's going to be presenting about what makes an online post great, how to effectively communicate and promote archaeology and cultural heritage on social media. And Rebecca was extremely uh, prepared and was able to share her video with us beforehand. So I will now share that now. Da -da -da. Where is it? There it is. Sharing sound. Okay. Oh, sorry, let me get it on full screen from the beginning it would be useful as well. Okay. Welcome everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Rebecca Gergatz and I work as an archaeologist in the Hungarian National Museum. I also have a blog about archaeology for non-professionals called Földkarn Diesmi, which could be translated as field adventure and so on. And and I'm also making content for the Association of Hungarian Archaeologists. As I am making quite a lot of content for social media platforms, I became interested in what makes a great post about archaeology that people will love. I wanted to dive a bit deeper into this and some related topics, so I made a questionnaire about it focusing on the Hungarian situation. The questionnaire consisted of a total of 58 questions. In Hungary, Facebook and Instagram are the most popular social platforms. So my target audience was the people on Facebook and Instagram who followed or liked archaeology themed Hungarian pages. So I shared it on these platforms and uh, sent it to my newsletter subscribers too. Between the 13th and 24th of July 2022, a total of 206 people filled out the questionnaire about 58% uh, were men and 42% uh, were women. Their age, residence and uh, education data is similar to the meta statistics of my own followers, which means that the majority of them are between 25 and 55 year olds, people living in the capital or its agglomeration and those with higher education. The questionnaire itself consisted of eight parts. You can see them on the slide, but in this presentation, I will talk more about the questions and results of the first part of it, where I was interested in people's thoughts on the characteristics and topics of online posts. If you think about it, an online post is like a cake. It needs some basic ingredients, which you need for it to be a cake or a post. Then you can customize it for your own taste, or the occasion of the cake, like the platform where you would like to share your post, and last but not least, you need people to share it with, no matter if it's a cake or an online post. But now let's start with the most basic ingredients. In the questionnaire, 
People could indicate on a scale from 1 to 5 how important the 10 characteristics are to them in the case of an online post. 1 meant not important at all and 5 meant very important. On the slide you can see the average value obtained for each component arranged in order of uh, importance. According to the people who filled out the questionnaire, the two most important things are that the text of the post is informative and easily understandable, and the third most important is the description of what you can see in the pictures of the post. So basically, people would like to understand the topic of the post. Another significant component of a great online post are the professional credibility and scientific activity of the author and uh, his or her proficiency in the topic of the post. So content consumers want the contents from people who are really knowledgeable about the subjects they are writing about. And just after that, in the sixth place comes a nice picture which is obviously important if you want to catch people's attention in social media. On social media. And the least but the still important components are rather complementary to the post, like the indication of the author of the post, also on institutional pages, references and designation of few sources, recommendation of additional related materials on the topic, and the unified design and appearance. These things, except the design part, are primarily important to us archaeologists and heritage managers rather than the consumers of our contents, but we should include them anyway. In the next question, people could write their thoughts about this topic and uh, could supplement the previous ones with their further insights into what are the things that they are still important to them as content consumers. Some of it is about the text, text like uh, not only the image, but also the title of the post uh, should attract people's attention and your text shouldn't be too long nor too short. If your text is longer than a few sentences, you should use subheadings so people could get a clue about which part of the text they are interested in. Also, a very basic but important thing is that the spelling must be very good, if not perfect, because if it's usually bad, people will assume this about the content too. Another important thing is the use of alt text for the pictures, which can uh, help people with visual impairment to enjoy our posts. And the other three is more about the context of our posts. A lot of time when professionals make online content, they forget that not everybody has the same background knowledge as they do. But we need to put everything in some context. Like if we talk about an archaeological culture, we should indicate the relevant dates and the geographical locations so that people can place them among their existing knowledge. Another important thing is uh, visualization. If you write about an archaeological object type, like a fibula, we should put it into context too. And uh, one of the best practices for it is by using reconstruction drawings and illustrations so content consumer consumers can see how the people of the past use them. But what's the point of making the best cake or online post of the world if you don't have people to share it with? Nothing. Because the most important part of content creation is engaging with the public. In the previously mentioned questions, there were two very common answers which were related to this part of the content creation process. One of them was regularity, because in uh, Hungary a lot of people do online content creation on top of his or her regular job and they usually do not have the time nor the energy for maintaining a posting schedule. So it is a valid criticism. And the other common answer was answering care questions. Some of you may think that it is so basic to answer questions in the comment section or in direct messages, but uh, sadly it uh, isn't for everybody. However, it really can hurt our engagement because if we expect people 
to read our posts, but we don't answer the questions they ask, then a relationship becomes uh, one-sided and then it ends. Because why would anyone follow a site that uh, doesn't even give them answers for a simple question? So based on the questionnaire, these would be the most important components of a good online post. Also, there was no time for this now. It would uh, definitely be interesting to compare this uh, data with the statistics of some archaeology and pages in the future. I hope you could find some value in this presentation and uh, that it can help you to engage your people, your audience, uh, even more in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, for that lovely uh, talk. Uh, next up, we have a talk from Maria. This was also pre-recorded, and I just need to check whether it has indeed downloaded onto my computer. Mm -hmm. Okay, unfortunately, I am having some issues with this. However, uh, we do have a backup uh, lovely recording, but maybe uh, is, is uh, that backup recording set up and ready to go or uh, shall we ask if perhaps Laura who I also see is here can already perhaps do her presentation first and then we can do Maria after. Uh, by the way if anyone's wondering who I'm talking to I'm talking to our lovely organizers Save Cultural Heritage Group. Ah, do I see a screen sharing? Perfect. Then I will mute myself. Final thing by the way anyone who also wants to watch this on the YouTube live rather than Zoom the link is now in the chat so do go check that out if you prefer. Enjoy this presentation. In 2020, a national lockdown was implemented in Greece as a result of the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020, a national lockdown was implemented in Greece as a result of the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. Greek museums followed the lead and in mid-March of the same year shut their doors to the public. A necessity for museums to switch their mission and activities towards a more digital path occurred, as the lockdown restrictions were changing quite often. Regarding the concept In 2020, a national lockdown was implemented in Greece as a result of the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. Greek museums followed the lead and in mid-March of the same year shut their doors to the public. A necessity for museums. In 2020, a national lockdown was implemented in Greece as a result of the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. Greek museums followed the lead and in mid-March of the same year shut their doors to the public. A necessity for museums to switch their mission and activities towards a more digital path occurred as the lockdown restrictions were changing quite often. Regarding the consequences of the pandemic in Greek museums, the president of the Greek Association of ICOM, Kati Hadzimikolaou, stated, the museum of tomorrow will not be the same as the museum of yesterday. The digital turn is a fact. Nonetheless, the balance between real and digital is desirable, and we now must search for the right mixture between the material and material world. Following the updates on five prominent archaeological museums of Greece through their website, the talk is part of my master thesis entitled Educational Programs in Greek Museums and will refer to the online activities that these museums are offering for children as a way to both entertain and educate them in an informal way during the pandemic of 2020. More specifically, the digital activities of the Acropolis Museum, the National Archaeological Museum, the Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki, the Archaeological Museum of Heraklion, and the Archaeological Museum of Delphi are mentioned, and their online activities two years later are explored. Let's start with the Acropolis Museum. Acropolis Museum is the most visited museum of Greece, and as such, it is the only one of the museums that we will mention here which has developed a different website for kids. The site is called Acropolis Museum Kids and it was created specifically for children of the ages 6 up to 12, one year before the pandemic in 2019. According to the site's information, it was developed with the aim to attract children from all over the world and encourage them to actively engage with the museum 
using fun and informative activities and games, some of which are digital and others which can be done offline at home. Taking a look at the interface of the Acropolis Museum Kids website, we can see that it is easy to use and offers many interactive experiences for children, both in Greek and English language. The user can distinguish four main sections in the site – Fun, News, the Museum and Gallery. The Fun section refers to games, videos and crafts that can help children have fun and learn in an enjoyable way. The games offered here are connected to the Parthenon and the Museum's exhibits and during 2020 they were free. Mission SAMM, Unite the Parthenon Sculptures, Higan Domahi, and Horse Memory Race. At present, these games are still available, along with two more, Secrets Hidden in the Soil and Rock Chisel Scribble, that were added during this two-year period. Regarding the videos provided, they are aiming at guiding children through a bizarre walk in the Acropolis and a morning in ancient Athens. The last subsection is called Make, and it is related with ideas on crafts that, ki that kids can make at home with the help of their parents. This craft in 2020 included an ancient edition cooking class to make an ancient fruit salad, the coloring of the sea bodied demon, the making of an inx, which is an ancient Greek toy, and the creation of three blocks of the Parthenon frieze, and in 2022 they have been enriched by a homemade pomegranate craft. The new section contains information regarding new activities for children offered by the museum, and the museum section presents a word of welcome and a future possibility for the virtual visits of the Acropolis Museum. In the last section of the website entitled Gallery, children can share artwork made by them as an inspiration from the muse museum and its exhibits. Moving on to the National Archaeological Museum, which is the largest in Greece and the second most visited one. The museum's website offers six online activities together with downloadable educational material for children in the section of education in Greek language. Five of these activities were provided during 2020 and one was added more recently. The newest activity is entitled We Welcome the Swallows of the Spring and invites the children to read the story of the swallow from the fresco of spring as well as download the online material and color it or make crafts. Meet Games is the name of another activity where children, together with the Sphinx, are requested to solve riddles associated with mythical creatures and create their own mythical creature and its story. A third activity, Pegasus, simulates a connect the dots game, leading children to a final drawing of a mythical creature. Riddle is another activity that is similar to Sudoku, where numbers have been replaced by ancient artifacts. The last two activities, entitled Medusa Mask and Siren, offer children the possibility of crafting their own mask and making their own puzzle respectively. Through these discovery games and artistic crafts, children can use the free time creatively and become acquainted with the museum exhibits. The third museum I will be talking about is the Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki, one of the largest and most visited museums in Greece. The museum provides online activities for children that are accessible in Greek in the news section of its website under the subsection Digital Events. The activities became available during the pandemic of 2020, with the exception of only three new activities in 2022, and they cover a variety of time periods associated with parts of the museum's exhibitions. Children can download the online material and can also choose to send their museum-related crafts and artwork as a photo via email and see them exhibited digitally in the museum's website. The activities offered by the Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki consist mostly of home crafts and art making. An activity called We Stay at Home and Make a Doll gives tips to children in order to create paper dolls. Another one, entitled We Stay Home and Make an Origami Bird, offers information on how to make an origami bird. The same applies with the activities We Make a Paper Rust from Oak Leaves, I Make My Own Mask and Dress Up, we stay safe and color the museum antiquities, as well as the newest ones, I make a mosaic from seeds and nuts, I make bunnies, and I make out of dolls. A different kind of interactive activity was entitled Time Alters Everything and Everything Stays the Same, and offered photos of some of the museum's ancient objects to the children, requesting them to find corresponding objects around their home, take pictures of them, and send them via email to the museum. 
After the activity deadline, a digital exhibition of the children's stand photographs was set up. One last activity called Seascape invites children to make a collage inspired by the seascape of one of the museum's marble sarcophagi and send them as a photo via email to the museum so as to be exhi exhibited digitally. The last two museums I would refer to are the Archaeological Museum of Heraklion and the Archaeological Museum of Delphi. During my research, I could only find holiday homecraft activities related to the Archaeological Museum of Heraklion, but no other indication of online activities for children in either of those two museums from then until today. Concluding this research, we can note that three out of the five most visited Greek archaeological museums do offer a small variety of activities in their digital environment, including online games of different sorts, such as discovery games, memory games, riddles, puzzles and questions, homecraft suggestions, entertaining short videos, and virtual visits for children. However, the activities remain the same for the most part, even two years after the pandemic, indicating that Greek museums prefer a more face-to-face -face approach rather than an online interactive experience. Thank you. Okay, so unfortunately, uh, Maria is probably unable to make it today for the question and answer session. However, if anyone has any questions for her after seeing that, I'm sure she'd be happy to be contacted. Uh, you can find her details in the catalogue. Next up, we have our first live speaker of the session. Very exciting. Lots of pressure. Oh, of course. I'm just kidding. Of course, there's absolutely no pressure. We're all a very friendly family here. Uh, we have Dr. Laura Castro Arroyo uh, talking about divulgation, and I know I completely butchered that word. However, <laughs> hopefully you will be able to say it much better than me. Um, so, Laura, if you would like to share your screen and video, and uh, we sure. can get started. Can everyone see it? And can everyone yes, hear me can. properly? Perfect. We can see you, we can see the screen, we can hear you. Take it away. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So hello, everybody, in case you joined the first session of this amazing ARC talk. And um, also, happy archaeology day to everyone. Uh, if you joined the first session, you already know me, but I am Laura, or also known as Plumas, in this um, well, on the internet. And today, I am delighted to be here to talk about something that I really like, which is this word that you have on screen here, divulgación. Divulgación is the act of sharing with the general public anything from a professional field. And I'm saying anything because we have divulgación científica in Spanish, and that is from scientist point of view, but also at least for Spanish readers and Spanish consuming audience, divulgación is such an important part of their entertainment, especially after, during and after the pandemic. So we don't have a word like this in English, not that I'm aware of, at least the divulgate is a false friend for us, it's not exactly the same. So. I'm hoping that I can uh, you know, bring the Spanish community a little bit closer uh, to you. And um, I, I just wanted not just to speak about my own experience because I, I have been doing this for a while and I've moved to, like, I've touched every platform, like on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook once and some kind of issue in YouTube. But then I found my thing, which is Twitch. So the challenge here is uh, for me to speak and share my own experience and others and not to seem like Twitch is like sponsoring me or anything, because trust me, they're not. Um, so what we are going to do is not just cover my own experience, but three channels. My personal, which is Las Plumas de Seymour. Then we have Ad Absurdum, which um, is a channel that divulgación makes divulgación through humor history and humor and then we have el café de la lluvia which will be translated as the coffee of the rain that does um fantastic things i'm not going to spoil anything for you so pre previously i want to show you a little bit what they do and i'm going to start with them with uh, because el café de la lluvia is the one that's been the longest online these <clears throat> sorry these started as a um, week now oh, <laughs> the nervous pressure <clears throat> Perfect. These started as a radio program. It's like a proper radio program in the Spanish um, audience, for the Spanish audiences with a radio studio. And they've been merging and moving to other platforms. And what they do here is what we can call culture, like divulgación cultural, like cultural divulgación in general. They cover a variety of topics. They don't focus on anything particularly, but they do 
an informative session. They do a lot of round tables. They bring debates with proper um, scholars in here. This was just from this morning because they have uh, their own uh, first, um, I think it was, I don't know if it's uh, Rebecca or Maria that spoke about how important regularity is. So every single weekend, we can go online to watch the matinee of El, El Café de la Lluvia and they have a program already for the viewers to to enjoy and just they move into it and they, they have um, their amazing programs. And um, in this case, they were talking about some mummies that had been recently uh, discovered in, in Egypt. And also they talked about comics, superheroes, and uh, much more with all the of their guests and cooperators. This, this is a quite, it will be like a similar, it will be the closest, I think, to a regular TV program, but, but um, we have it on Twitch. And also, I this this is something I really like about uh, Twitch, the platform, is that since it's live, in case you're not familiar with Twitch, Twitch is a platform for streaming, which mainly has been used to stream video games and gameplays. But recently, and especially during the pandemic and the post-pandemic world, it has been used for all the things. The reason I wanted to talk about it is because I think it offers so many opportunities. And again, I'm not a sponsored person on Twitch or whatever, but I see how we can use this to make divulgación about culture, heritage, and many more stuff. Because in here, what they did, for example, was follow, do you remember the mummy parade? When they moved the mummies into the new museum of Cairo, they did a live session when they were commenting with a doctor in, uh, in Egyptology, which is this uh, lady you have on top. Her name is Dr. Aroa Velasco, and she's an expert on, on um, ancient Egypt. And they were commenting live. And this is brilliant because normally you want to not have these kind of content in like on regular TV or anything, and you are doing it at the very minute. Because of the rise of Twitch, YouTube incorporated a live system, which is what we use it now. But I need to say that I've used that as well. But in on Twitch, it's like prepared for doing that. So it's focused on, on the task and it's much more intuitive. Then we have Al Absurdum. And Al Absurdum is a consolidated pillar of Spanish-speaking divulgación. They've written multiple books about um, history and not just Spanish history, but general uh, history uh, of um, uh, worldwide history. And um, what they do is that they tell history with a touch of humor. And this is something that has proven to be super effective within like, the big public and the general audience. They have audiences from very young children to, you know, uh, the elders of our communities. And when they move to Twitch, what they do is a little bit more like, um, interview program. It was so successful. They were so successful that fortunately for us in Spanish TV, we have El Condensador de Fluza, which is the first TV program of cultural divulgación in Spain. And this was from, it was the, it was started in 2021. And this is such a huge step for Spanish culture creation and for Spanish media, because I, again, is the first one. And I'm very proud to say that some of my friends were at the back of it, which is incredible. And finally, there's my own Twitch channel. I am a little bit different in the sense that I do focus on something. I do uh, Iranian studies, which are not very much shared with general public. And uh, that what I do is, on the one hand, I share, you know, just can lecture like content or I comment on books and I kind of emphasize things that I don't like, you know, like a critique because generally the Iranian field studies is not very approached. It's not approached by the general public. At least in Spanish uh, speaking um, audiences, they barely know much about it. So that's like, I am a kind of the first step for them to know. But also I explore all the methods to doing so. Video games and again, humor and postcards. We do interviews in there. And uh, the one below was a particularly successful one because I played Age of Empires. And I was telling the audience as I was playing, if the things that they were saying were really Persian or not. Now, can this be done on the platforms? Definitely. But Twitch has something that other people, like other platforms do not, um, do not have. First of all, it's very accessible. There's live interaction and it lets for more than a seminar, although you can make it look like a seminar. And the best thing about it is building a community. True. Every kind of social media platform is based on a community, but Twitch is catered to a very specific kind of audience, the live audience, the audience that actually enjoys commenting and being there. 
in the post-pandemic uh, atmosphere, a lot of people turned to Twitch because they were not satisfied with um, what they could consume in normal I say media, uh, like they, especially I'm thinking of TV, but many people turn from YouTube to Twitch because they feel accompanied and the feeling of being live as close as it can be, it proved to be very, very successful among the, the Spanish public. Some of them, some of the creators uh, in Spanish, we've called this the alternative academia, although you can make it as everything in life, as academic as you want. Um, and also a, a beautiful window for creating an international community that gathers at the very same time, because they have, you have a moment for your audience to come, to talk to you, and to talk to all the people and to learn together about all the, all the things. Also, us creators can be monetarily supported and we have backers, which is uh, amazing. And everything, I don't know about projects, like English speaking projects or in other communities, I'm pretty sure we must not be the only ones. But what we aim is this sharing with the general public history, because we do believe that it's not just ours from for the academics, it's everyone else's and complementing with all the people that are doing this on all the social media, like more traditional thinking on Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. Twitch now is a brilliant platform because, again, I can't express enough how tailored it is for a very specific kind of audience, which is, for example, mine or the audience of uh, my friend's uh, projects. And um, uh, yeah, I, like for example, in here, we celebrated Yalla. And of course, I could upload a video about the Yalla night. But what we did was celebrate it live. And we did that on the very day, the very same day. And we did predictions with Hafez. So you're teaching, you're having fun, and you're doing that in the moment. So um, unfortunately, my talk was not as <laughs> informative, but rather it was to talk about my experience and to invite people that maybe want to explore that side of sharing with the general public, try and um, to try Twitch and build like a different kind of community. And this community allowed me to be in contact with other creators so I could create this book, which is a reflection. It's like a, an essay on on Sufism and video games, which is video games. I'm a, I'm a big fan and I do use a lot of video games to teach history. So there's a lot of opportunities I could just draw from here. And yeah, that's basically everything I have to say in case you want to check any of the projects. Do you want to learn Spanish to learn where they are? I do bilingual content, but unfortunately my friends only do Spanish content. So if you want to learn for that, and if not, that is perfectly okay. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I hope you were entertained for just a little bit. So over to you, Tilly, again. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I'm now very keen to try out Twitch. It's never been something I've thought about. <laughs> Okay, um, we're still nicely ahead of schedule, but we, I think we will just continue and then we can have a nice longer uh, question and answer session. By the way, for all those watching, uh, as you can see in the uh, uh, program, we do indeed have a, a half hour question and answer session at the end of this session. So be thinking about what kind of questions you have for people and uh, we can either do them live or through the chat at the end. So thinking caps on. Okay, our next talk is another pre-recorded one. However, it will be shared by the great lady herself. So we have Blanche Kennedy talking about museums and digital technologies. So Blanche, if you would like to share your screen. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now and get it up. Okay. It's looking good. Yeah. Great, all right. Hi, my name is Blanche and today I'm gonna to be talking about museums and digital technologies on engaging audiences in a collaborative and interpersonal relationship. Museums have begun to engage in digital technologies in an attempt to gain greater audience engagement. The incorporation of new digital technologies within the museum arena which actively participate with their audiences has been achieved under the new museological framework of visitor-centered learning. This incorporation of new digitally based pedagogies has in turn changed the nature of visitor engagement and in effect facilitated a more collaborative relationship between the audience and these institutions. Furthermore, this incorporation has given rise to recognize communities and social and cultural groups whose voices have historically been underrepresented and marginalized from museum collections and spaces. 
This shift in recent years has included a movement towards incorporating new digital technologies into the public programming and curatorial arrangements of museums. In particular, there has been a movement towards utilizing new digital technologies within the museum to engage audiences in a collaborative and interpersonal relationship with the museum. And this shift will be analyzed through two case studies of this talk. The first case study is the South London, South London Gallery Art Prize, Bloomberg New Contemporaries. Hi, my name is Blunt. Oh, sorry, one second. The first case study is the South London Gallery's Art Prize, Bloomberg New Contemporaries, adjustment and reconfiguration of the exhibit during the London COVID-19 lockdown to present a digitalized interpretation of the exhibit with a higher visitor centered focus. The second case study will focus on the Brooklyn Museum's app Ask, which is a clear example of new museological ideals implemented through a visitor centered app that investigates and creates a collaborative dialogue with its audience. This talk will conclude that both digitalized responses to audience engagement are tangible representations of how these digital technologies have attempted to engage with audiences as collaborative partners to their collections. Firstly, this talk will expand on the ideas of new museology by utilizing the contemporary literature on visitor-centered learning. This will help develop an understanding as to why digital technologies are helping expand new museological advances for democratic audience engagement. To begin, it is important to recognize through the sociological work of Tony Bennett that the museum has a systemic imprint of its public social and aesthetic preferences and values and epistemically alters the public perceptions of culture and knowledge. However, due to the rise of new museology, the epistemic role of the museum has changed and given way to a more democratic pedagogical and curatorial practice. These practices have included a thematic focus on exhibits that actively participate with their audience and in so doing, connect to their visitor, going so far as to view them as co-collaborators and an essential part of the museum's very functioning. Douglas Wartz has described this shift in museology as achievable through recognizing that the museum is a place of living culture. Through this recognition, museums are able to understand their position within society as spaces of living and breathing culture, which may facilitate public discourse and act as a socially aware cultural entity. This ideological shift in museums applying self-aware analysis to reimagine their public role has given rise to museums respectively engaging with social and cultural groups that may have otherwise been marginalized and misrepresented from their spaces. This effort from museums to partake in an internal self-reflection to understand their knowledge systems and the social and cultural hegemony they impart on their systemic imprint within culture at large has been discussed by the museologist Gretchen Jennings. Jennings has developed a humanist framework for empathic audience engagement, founded in a sociological understanding of the social dynamics of meaning making within the museum and in response to the material displayed. Jennings suggests that the use of empathic based learning models in museums helps shape the sense of the audience into viewing difference and otherness as an attractive quality. The empathic based museum pursuits have been described by Michael Belcher as a space for experiential encounters between the audience and the institution's collections. This visitor centered model has been described by Margaret Lindor as a collaborative relationship between the museum and the visitor and has given rise to recognize how, di how digital technologies can advance their collaborative relationship. These digital technologies will in effect undoubtedly change the nature of audience engagement and further develop the efforts of new museology to create greater visitor centered pedagogy that reach audiences that otherwise may physically or socially be unable to enter the museum space. In turn, this will help deepen the democratic processes imparted through the ideology of the new museum. The first case study is the South London Gallery's Art Prize Bloomberg New Contemporaries adjustment and reconfiguration of the exhibit during the London COVID-19 lockdown to present a digitalized interpretation of the exhibit with a higher visitor centered focus. The second case study will focus on the Brooklyn oh. Museum. 
Sorry, I think it's actually gone to the yeah. The first case study to be analysed is the South London Gallery, a contemporary gallery situated in the University of the Arts London Camberwell. The gallery is small but holds notable contemporary artists ranging from the local contemporary artists such as the 2019 Turner Prize winner Oscar Murillo and houses a permanent collection of artworks including several from Camberwell and Goldsmiths alumni including the YBAs. South London Gallery's showcase of an annual art prize for contemporary artists called the BNC, usually shown within the gallery, has been adapted during the COVID-19 lockdown. BNC insisted that the digital exhibit where artists were selected during the British lockdown were connected via Zoom and still enacted and uh, responded to. The panel of judges who eventually decided to postpone the exhibit instead created the exhibit's digital online platform to display all 36 artists artworks. Therefore, the audience would not miss out on the exhibit and could interact with the artworks within a new and more physically accessible medium. This change effectively made the team at BNC and furthermore at South London Gallery reconsider questions around the use of digital technologies within museums. The first case study, this, this change effectively made the team at BNC and furthermore at South London Gallery reconsider questions around the use of digital technologies within museums, posing questions like, what opportunities the digital space might, should, and could offer to the artists and audiences? And how does this dominant history impact working digitally? Will comparison still be made to in real life experiences? Such questions like this were dealt with by arranging an audio response and panel discussion, which were then uploaded onto the exhibit web page and presented to the public, creating a dialogue with their audience. BNC's digitalized response to COVID-19 was a vast change from the fellow art prizes and exhibits around the UK during the lockdown. For example, the Turner Prize, an annual art prize for contemporary British artists, decided to surpass the award for that year. BNC's adaption to COVID-19 similarly fits the gallery's democratic, liberal and socially minded ethos Unlike other museums, including British institutions such as the British Museum, South London Gallery has historically reported higher numbers of visitor demographics from marginalised ethnic and black communities than that of their counter institutions. The gallery's diverse audience has effectively influenced its choice to implement programming that is more democratic in nature. This is included, but is not limited to, an external gallery in the public housing building across from the museum to engage and co-create and curate with its local residents. This, this change effectively... Another museum using digital technology to increase its visitor-centered focus is the Brooklyn Museum, which has implemented several digitally focused engagement strategies over the past decade. The Brooklyn Museum, one of the oldest museums in the US, houses thematically arranged different galleries and wings ranging from feminist art, ancient antiquities and traveling contemporary art exhibits. The museum has helped lead the incorporation of digital technology within the museums in the US, noticeably with the museum's app Ask. Ask is an award-winning app that allows its audience to photograph from their phone an object in the museum's collection, upload it onto the app and ask a member of the museum's team to digitally, digitally engage in a dialogue with them via text message on the app. Ask, simply put, is a basic texting app where any visitor with a smartphone can directly engage with its staff to engage more deeply with the museum's objects, giving them a richer visitor engagement experience. In an interview with Sarah Devine, the director of the visitor experience and engagement at the museum, Devine stated that the visitor experience is everything. She meant it in all possible ways. It's our calling as well as our responsibility. What a visitor experiences with us and how is paramount. As a concept, the visitor experience encapsulates everything. Sarah's statement brings to the forefront the ideology of the museum, and although it is a well-renowned existing institution that once enacted in a transmission model of communication with its audience by disseminating knowledge to them, over the past two decades, the museum has shifted and transformed into a contemporary space with contemporary focused ideals. 
This shift has seen the museum park partake in a new museological practice, acting from a visitor-centered model of audience engagement. And our, an ask tangibly represents this model through a digitally focused pedagogical practice. Devine's mission statement for the incorporation of the digital technology succinct, succinctly encapsulates the museum's democratic, democratic ideology, with Devine stating that, I'm most interested in using technology to help create experiences and engagement with art and ideas. It can spark conversations, get people looking more closely and inspire wonder. It can also provide accessibility assistance. Furthermore, ask has the advantage to collect data and examine its user experience, not just of the app, but of the museum experience as a whole through the questions the audience ask, and from this, what they expect from the visit to the museum. The museum's use of the app and their goal of data collection and correlation in turn will allow the museum to understand larger scale questions about the fundamentals of visitor engagement, including their expectations and understanding of the museum at large. The use of the app in effect will help change the museum's very functioning as well as their ideological position as the data collected from us will be correlated into discovering how to evolve the museum practice. This is a clear example of how digital technology can help develop a deeper democratic collaborative relationship with the museum and the public and in turn change the very function of the museum. Another muse the technology utilized in both case studies embodies the efforts of new museology to collaboratively engage with the audience in, attempt, in an attempt to remodel society's knowledge of the role of the museum. These institutions use of digital technologies in an attempt to gain greater audience engagement, which will be achieved under the new museological framework of visitor-centered learning, have in and turn begun to further change the nature of visitor engagement and in effect deepen the collaborative relationship gained between the audience and these institutions. Furthermore, this change has facilitated a more inquisitive and recognizable appreciation for including communities and social and cultural groups whose voices have historically been undervalued from museum collections and spaces. This effort has been achieved by encouraging a democratically collaborative partnership between the cultural institution and the public and the development of future technology within the museum may be used to deepen this democratic process. Thank you everyone for listening. Okay, thank you very much Blanche. Um, okay, we have one more speaker and that is me. Uh, so I will share my screen and uh, da -da -da, here we go and get going. Okay, hopefully that's working. I assume that if it's not, people will let me know. So hello everyone, my name is Matilda Siebrecht and uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my experience uh, on uh, sharing archaeological knowledge uh, and archaeological research through social media. Uh, this is something that I try to advocate as much as possible alongside my uh, academic research because yes, uh, as we will discuss in a second, I think that there are many advantages to uh, social media outreach. So yes, first of all, a little bit about myself. Uh, as I said, I'm Mathilde Siebrecht. I'm, I'm currently studying uh, Paleo-Inuit material culture. I'm an artifact analyst um, at Groningen University in the Netherlands, but I also uh, do a lot of online content creation under the persona the Archaeologist Teacup, um, which you may have seen sharing lots of things as well uh, for this very event. And uh, I wanted to indeed talk a little bit about the sort of advantages and disadvantages of using social media, my experiences with it, and what I think is how you know where to start. So hopefully uh, after this, you might have a little bit of inspiration. So first of all, let's consider the advantages and the disadvantages. I think it's important to look at both of social media in comparison to other, and I'm looking at other forms of academic communication. So for example, conference talks, papers, posters, et cetera. In terms of disadvantages, of course, the main one is that there is no such thing as, for example, peer review on the internet, although I would argue that everyone is reviewer too on the internet. So, you know, you gotta actually, in my view, be even more careful about what you post because you're bound to have someone commenting and going, actually, I think you'll find. Uh, so I would disagree with that one, but it is a case that there's no kind of academic level peer review 
Um, and in that respect, the work that you do on content creation online on social media is not considered with the same level as potentially peer reviewed academic output by your peers and other academic colleagues. Related to that is this issue of authority or lack thereof. A lot of people, I think, are quite scared of posting on social media because there's that feeling that once you have put content out there, it's no longer under your control and anyone can do with it what they will. Again, this is something that I think is actually quite uh, invigorating and quite freeing, but it is indeed something that a lot of people um, struggle with on a personal level and a professional level. There is, of course, the ethics of posting on social media. For example, uh, I work with Indigenous communities. A lot of the content that I share is fine, but there might be some things where I cannot share it just simply because it is sacred to a particular community or it is something that is forbidden to show uh, visually or to be shared outside of the community. Um, there is also the issue, for example, of looting of archaeological sites. So quite often, if people are working on an excavation, they just can't show that much information about the site they're working on for the fear of uh, people finding out where it is and coming and uh, stealing uh, cultural heritage. In terms of the sort of practical applications of it, there's, of course, the issue of time. Most academics that I talk to say, yeah, but how on earth am I supposed to create all of this online content alongside my own academic output? I don't have the time for that. And that is definitely something that's an issue and something I hope to address today. Uh, and of course, there's the issue of sustainable content creation. A lot of the speakers today have talked about engagement and the fact that it's not just about creating content, but it's also about creating content that actively engages with your audience. And also, as Rebecca mentioned, consistency is the key, but creating consistent, sustainable, interesting, engaging content is something that I know a lot of people struggle with. So those are just a couple. There are probably many more, but I just sort of wanted to highlight the main ones. But in terms of advantages, one of the biggest ones, I think, and something that Blanche also just touched on in her talk is the fact that you can reach a much wider audience through the digital platforms in general. But social media also has that opportunity to share using, for example, hashtags or to post in groups or to associate yourself with particular tags or groups that then reach a much wider audience than would be simply searching for keywords for your content, which is quite nice. It's also free, which is fantastic compared to, for example, academic conferences or quite often uh, paywalls or publishing fees. That uh, yeah is definitely a big advantage in my view. It's also one platform to reach a wide audience. And that means that you don't have to uh, publish, for example, academic findings in this journal, plus make a nice accessible post for this thing, plus create a poster for something else. You can do it all on one platform. And so long as you do it in a way that, as Rebecca said in her talk as well, is giving enough information and giving correct information, it should be that you can reach different levels of the audience or different uh, facets of society, shall we say, through one platform or one post. Uh, what I like is that there's also equal judgment on the internet. This relates a little bit to the issue of peer review that I mentioned earlier. If a professor of archaeology with 40 years experiences posts something on Twitter, and if a bachelor student with one year of experience posts something on Twitter, they are seen by the same audience and they are considered in the same way, especially if you don't know them personally or professionally, which some people might say is a bad thing. But I would say that actually this is an advantage because it means that you are based solely on the content you create rather than your name and relying on kind of something that you did 40 years ago, potentially. And this is potentially one way of dismantling the ivory tower of academia in that respect. It's also, of course, an extremely approachable platform. And this kind of ties into all of the other points that I've made here. So hopefully you're, you know, along, along with me in the ride and agree that indeed social media is a lovely platform for showing and, and finding the value of archaeological research. Another, by the way, I, I included finding the value of archaeological research in my talk here because I think that one of the big advantages of this is that not only do you uh, share the work, but in order to make sure that the work you're doing is still relevant to society, people have to be interested in it and have to accept it. So if you're posting content and no one's interested, maybe it's the content that's the issue and maybe you should then readdress the direction that your research is taking you. And that's also similar to what Blanche was just mentioning in terms of museums uh, looking at how they're, uh, how they're actually practicing museology in that respect. So it's a similar aspect um, in terms of social media for, for sharing and outreach. So what's my tactic? Well, uh, my main platform is Instagram that I use as the archaeologist teacup. And I've recently discovered that reels are apparently something that I'm quite good at. So I did uh, at the end of last year, I had a bit of a rebrand on Instagram and I decided, right, okay, I want to 
come away from the sort of random assortment of content that I was creating. I was doing some archaeological stuff, some personal stuff, all kinds of things. And I want to have some solid aims. Why am I using this platform? What can I achieve with it? I wanted to inspire interest in archaeology from my audience, share archaeological information. But I also wanted to try and provide an example for my colleagues that you don't have to spend 40 hours a week uh, doing social media outreach in order to create accessible research. So I was hoping that this could be almost a, a sort of case study and an example for others uh, to follow in my footsteps. And so how did I do this? Well, and I decided to post reels. Uh, in going with my kind of brand of the archaeologist teacup, and I'll talk a little bit more about this idea of a brand in a second, I decided to look uh, schedule my reels on tea days uh, every Tuesday and Thursday. Unfortunately, I've now had to cut back a bit and I now only do Tuesdays. And I wanted to look at information on archaeological objects, so I would focus on a particular object uh, in every post look at the history of object types, but also provide very short insights into archaeological research and terminology, because this is also something that is quite often inaccessible to people who don't have access to education in archaeology or archaeological uh, articles, for example, or textbooks. And uh, what happened? Well, <laughs> amazingly, uh, I saw a response even within kind of one week. I, I think that this graph is a little bit small to see, but basically at the end of November, uh, I had about 600, 666 followers was exactly my follower count, which I thought was a little freaky, but anyway. Um, and even within one week, it just had soared so much more compared to the previous three years uh, that I had been doing this creation. And the results were in terms of the amount of followers that I have. I found that Reels had significantly more reach to those who weren't already following me than simple posts. So I reached a lot more non-followers. And I also noticed that there were definite spikes in my amount of followers following T-Day posts. And of course, I did have some people unfollow me over time who were just kind of spontaneously clicking. But in general, the as you saw from the graph before, it generally increased uh, pretty nicely. But of course, as we have spoken about, it's not just about how many people follow you, it's how many people actually engage with your content. And I found that this also increased a lot. So I had a significant increase in visits to my profile, in visits to my website, which I had linked to the profile. I also had a lot more interactions on my normal posts as well, because I also was still doing more normal posts on, on other topics and on my PhD work, et cetera. But indeed, this increased traffic to in external links. And I also did notice that increase in community building, which Laura mentioned as well. So uh, you had a lot of, for example, nice comments on screen underneath the video. People weren't just liking it or sharing it. They were actually really engaging with the material. People were saying, wow, this is interesting. What about this question? Or asking questions or sharing information that they'd found somewhere else, sharing links to other things giving their own uh, ideas and points based on what I have been saying in my video, which I was just thrilled about. I hadn't had that much engagement from people before. And also off screen, I, I meant to say just then as well, uh, so many of my friends who are non-archaeologists, for example, when I would chat to them, they'd be like, oh, by the way, I found that really interesting what you shared the other day. I never realized that and I hadn't thought about that. And actually, blah, blah, blah. And we'd have a talk for 10 minutes about archaeology, which never happened before. They were never that interested in things. So. I found that this was a really great way to then kind of tap into a new audience, start building a community, and it's increased amazingly now. Now I have a lot more followers and a lot more engagement as well, um, which is fantastic. But I wanted to uh, show not just kind of how I did it, but how some others have done it. So I have three uh, different um, accounts here that are all based uh, on various platforms, uh, various social media platforms. And I wanted to share a bit how they had approached this idea of finding and engaging with your audience. And it's important to think about who your intended audience is. Who do you actually want to uh, yeah, involve in your research and have as part of your community? And how can you find them? But also most importantly, why would they want to follow you? What would cause them to be interested enough to click that link? And one of the ideas of this is related to the idea of having your own kind of brand interested in, but also something that then others might be interested in that is not necessarily related exactly to archaeology and cultural heritage. So I chose a kind of tea cup, tea. The idea for that was, you know, tea is a pretty universal concept. I think nearly every culture in the world has some version of tea. But also that idea of having a cup of tea to me just, you know, uh, implied this sort of cozy get together gathering of like minded individuals who just wanted to have a chat about things that interested them, in my case, archaeology and cultural heritage. And uh, yeah, and it made it more accessible and more kind of inviting. And it also means that I can share lots of, for example, my different mugs. And then I talk about the archaeology related to my mugs and, and uh, different fun tea related facts, etc. 
So the first example uh, is Sasha van der Vaart uh, also known as the Overdressed Archaeologist, uh, as she is on mainly on Instagram, but she also has a lot of other platforms. And as well as being a very talented archaeologist, she's a curator at several museums uh, in the Netherlands, including the Antiquities Museum and also uh, the Drenthe uh, Prehistoric Museum up in the north of the Netherlands. She is also a model and a big fan of vintage uh, fashion um, and vintage modeling. So as well as sharing posts about, for example, this lovely dagger um, and uh, the relative associations of that in relation to archaeological research, she also shares a lot of posts that she has from her modeling career. And she shares these, for example, little shoe videos that she has where she kind of comes on in the pair of shoes, does a little twirl and then goes off again. And they're fantastically popular. But as she says, people come for the shoes, but they stay for the archaeology because they're intrigued by her profile. It looks very visually beautiful. If they're interested in vintage fashion as well, they click on, but then they start to learn a bit about archaeology and they start to engage more in that way. So she's tapped into an audience that might not necessarily have clicked on a purely archaeological profile, but because they see something that they're interested in, the vintage modeling, they then click on it and are, are dragged in, as they say. The next example is uh, Ethnosynology, aka David Ian Howe, who is a fantastic anthropologist as well in his own right. He also does a lot of different outreach activities. He has his own podcast. He's extremely successful on TikTok. He's managed to enter the TikTok market, which I am forever in awe of because I have no idea how to use TikTok. And basically, he uh, he studied actually um, projectile weaponry and uh, flint uh, technology as part of his actual research, but he's really interested in dogs. He has this lovely dog, Strider, who you can see in the center uh, of the presentation here. And he tries to always show uh, the sort of human side, shall we say, of human animal relationships, including uh, having dogs uh, in prehistory and showing how that has affected the development of humanity over time. And again, he, he intersperses this with other videos and he has a lot of humor as Laura said something with humor is also really important to engage your audience and he's a, a fantastic comedian um, so he creates really great content from that too so he has this lovely in conversations with a caveman series that he does where you know you give a caveman a jar of Nutella and you give a caveman an axe and you know how would he react but uh, as he says everyone loves dogs people see all these dog pictures people come to his account for the dogs and again, they stay for the archaeology. They become interested in that aspect of things. So again, he's found a whole new audience and kind of encouraged them to, to look at uh, dogs in a different way from an archaeological and cultural heritage perspective. And my final example is not as related to this idea of branding, but uh, it's still, it still really encapsulates the idea that Laura also mentioned of encompassing humor into your posts. And this is the Kaithness Broch project. Uh, Kenneth McElroy is the one who runs the uh, social media. For those who are unaware of this project, a broch is a Stone Age, um, Stone Age, Iron Age stone tower from Scotland, uh, and they are found just in Scotland. There's lots of remains, but this project is aiming to um, revive uh, the cultural heritage of Caithness, especially through um, brochs. And they their aim, end aim is to do a complete rebuild experimental archaeology of a broch, which is fantastic. And uh, as he claims, he says, well, our social media pages feature surprisingly few posts about rocks because he is a very funny man and he posts all sorts of other things. He's a master of memes. I don't know how he does it. He always manages to include different things. And so people find him hilarious and people who have never heard of a broch before in their life have no idea where Keith Ness is, sees his work and go, oh, this is this is very funny. Oh, I'll like, oh, this is one's funny too. Oh, I'll follow him. And that is also how you can reach a different audience. He's especially uh, successful on, on Twitter. He also has, they also have an Instagram account. Um, but so these are just some examples of ways that you can still share archaeological and cultural heritage knowledge, but people who are first looking at your account might not necessarily be aware of that. And it might, you can almost, I don't want to say trick them because we're not tricking them, but it's just a way to find the angle to reach people outside our little sphere because of course, focused, uh, content, people who are already interested in archaeology will find you. But what if you want to share it outside your sphere? And these are, I think, some excellent examples of that. So to sum up, uh, what can you do and what can you take from this? Because this is why I wanted to, to share this talk with you. I think it's important to think about who your audience would be. Do you want to, for example, uh, encourage more women to join? Do you want to encourage minority groups to become more involved uh, with this? We talked about globalization in the last um, 
uh, session and how important it is to kind of decolonize the process of archaeology. But this can only happen if those outside academic archaeological spheres become aware of the work that's going on within them. So it's especially important. What kind of content do you post? I post more sort of general archaeological reels, but Laura does her live streams of uh, and special events and focuses on them. Museums might focus on just sort of digital museology. What platform will you use? I didn't go into this in a lot of detail. Perhaps we can discuss this more in the question and answer session, but that's also very important depending on which demographic you want to aim for and, and what kind of materials or visualizations you're gonna use. And also how often will you post? Consistency is key, but you don't have to post every day in order to be successful on social media. The main thing is that you're consistent. And yeah, the main thing is to play to your strengths. How could you brand yourself in such a way that it would still remain relevant to the core of who you are, but could also be adapted to share the archeological and the cultural heritage knowledge uh, that you have. So uh, thank you very much. Good luck with all of your uh, future endeavors on social media. If you would like to follow me and uh, see what it is I do, then there are my, my details there. Okay, <laughs> so that was uh, the end of the session, uh, the end of the talk. Uh, oh, thank you, I see a uh, little applauders. So we now have time for some lovely question and answers for our speakers. I apologize, by the way, I see I went a little bit over time. Prerogative of being the session moderator. Um, but uh, so if anyone has any questions for our speakers, please do feel free to raise your hand using the little function on Zoom. You can also type any questions you have directly into the chat. Uh, and we can make sure that we can uh, read them out. But to start us off, I have some questions for people that I have been noting down during the session. Uh, so Rebecca, first of all, apologies, sincere apologies for the mispronunciation of your name. Uh, yeah, I, I'm terrible with pronunciation and names. Um, but I'm curious, so you talked about sort of the content of the post and how it's important that we do share, you know, information and we don't just kind of oversimplify things. But I mean, how much information can you share? How simple can, do you have to go or how complex can you go, do you think, if you want to sort of reach a wider audience? I was curious of your thoughts on, on the sort of, yeah, complexity of, of the information you're sharing, if that makes sense. Unfortunately, we can't hear you. Oh, I heard something there. Hmm. No, we still can't hear you, but I did hear a so maybe it was nearly working. <laughs> no, unfortunately, we, we can't hear you. Uh, perhaps our uh, technical uh, elves uh, can, can offer some suggestions in the chat, if there are any. Oh, um, there might be, if you do the, the little... Uh, What's, it, what's the word, the little microphone uh, section, there's sort of the, the, to check that you're in the right, right one, in the right settings. Oh, <laughs> okay. Now we're, now we're completely nothing. <laughs> okay, one moment. Uh, I will, okay, Laura, I might just ask you a question. Um, and then while you're talking, I can, I can do some troubleshooting with, uh, <laughs> with uh, Rebecca. Um, so I'm curious, and when we had a mixture of live videos and a mixture of pre-recorded videos today as well, but how do you think sort of live compares to pre-recorded in terms of, for example, the information you can share, the kind of different facets that you can get into, if that makes sense? Okay, so I think this is just my personal experience and uh, something that's really good about live recording and doing a live session is that you can read the mood and read the audience it's not necessarily you need to stop at every single moment to answer the questions because you know this still needs to be a consistency for this cause but you can see when people are interested in something or for example you can divert the conversation uh, in one of my last live streams uh, we were talking about the Scythians and the Scythian gold and then audiences were very interested like my my um community the, the butcher that I call them which is like guys girls and guys in Persian um like my brand would be like I drink tea I like birds and I like dragons that's basically the brand <laughs> and uh, they liked horses and they wanted to know more about horses I did not have that on my script because of course I have a script when I do live um, audiences to not get lost in the beauty of it but they, if since they were more interested you can kind of 
shift a little bit and divert regarding what I'm not sure if it's just me that Laura has frozen for. <laughs> no, she has frozen for me as well. Ah, okay. Oh, such a shame. That's such a good answer. Okay. Unfortunately, Rebecca cannot hear me uh, and her microphone seems to uh, be struggling, but we have our little background elves uh, working on the issue in the meantime. Um, unfortunately, Laura also seems to have, uh, have left us momentarily. Hopefully she can come back soon. Oh, yeah. OK, hopefully she'll come back in a second. Uh, but Blanche, I also have a question for you. So we'll, we'll move on and hopefully we'll get somewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll work, we'll work on that. Um, so uh, I was curious. So you talked about, um, for example, the fact that, that there's been a different way that museums have seen what people want them to show in, in very simplified terms. I know you said it a lot more eloquently than I just did. Um, but do you think that might, how do you think, for example, the demographic of the people who are actually using digital platforms affects that? So because it, I assume anyway that maybe it's younger generations that might be more involved with the kind of digital side uh, of, of museums compared to, for example, older ones, and that might affect it. What are your thoughts on, uh, on that? Um, well, yeah, definitely. It would be younger demographics that know how to use digital technology. But um, I think the purpose of these museums is not necessarily to engage in older generations that have, you know, they've kind of already made up their mind about, you know, if they're going to be interested in that space. So the kind of, I guess, the like, the motivation of those institutions is to get in you know younger generations larger demographics to be able to join and then from there create more of a democratic environment with you know the new generations that are coming that would be my assumption at least and uh, just one further question uh, that i mm -hmm. had was in terms of the way that people interact with the actual material at the museum obviously does get affected whether you see it on a screen or whether you kind of see it in real life I remember you know there's so many objects that you see but then you see in real life and they're just that big or they're actually that big or, or something mm -hmm. like that mm. how do you think uh, do you know any examples of museums that have kind of dealt with this issue or, or how do you think museums can deal with that issue of kind of giving the same sort of perceptions that people have in real life well, yeah, I know that the British Museum utilises that a lot to show, you know, particular objects um, in more, you know, detailed form. And I think the purpose of that is to have more of an interactive experience with those inanimate objects. I think overall that's going to be a positive thing because if you can connect to objects in more of an emotional way or a personal way, you're going to create more of a connection and understanding to them rather than just seeing them in a, you know, curated in a you know behind glass or whatever it is or something that you can't touch I also know that not that it's digital technology but I know that British Museum now has something where you can actually go around and physically touch the objects and that's kind of those digital technologies are taking that one step further where you can inter interact with them virtually and also museums are starting to utilize VR technology a lot more which I know um, I've done some case studies on how in particular Holocaust museums have dealt with that and used um, VR and AR to create these like um, almost transient experiences where you can see yourself in say out the Auschwitz museum is utilized it so you can actually like enter Auschwitz um, through a VR headset. And I think overall those kind of things uh, or those kind of technologies create a yeah as I said an emotional relationship with it because once something's personal you can then imprint your own understanding on it rather than you know limited the kind of like limited sensation of just seeing an object and then kind of reading a didactic is never going to be to the same depth so I think yeah for the first question 
overall it will be towards younger audiences but that's also something that's an inevitable process of trying to get people who are more perceptive or like um no sorry receptive to knowledge is going to be that demographic and that utilizing you know the means of digital technology to create more overall connective relationships with the material is you know there will always be things that aren't necessarily positive or take away from the kind of traditional setting but um in general it's most likely going to have a positive effect good it's a nice optimistic view <laughs> um rebecca i see you are back shall we see if uh, your audio is working now maybe can you hear me excellent Great. we can hear you uh, so just to repeat my question briefly in terms of, of your thoughts on kind of how how simple you have to go on the content or how complex you can be in the content of of your post yeah i think there's a range so uh, it can be good if you so sorry i'm a little tired so um i can i think that you can share more or less but uh, between the maximum and the minimum. So you have to say if you are uh, talking about the period, for example, Iron Age Europe, you have to say that what was the time, the, the, <clears throat> the numbers. So people can know that it was before the Romans. Okay, so they can place it in, the, in their mind and knowledge uh, they have. And uh, where it was because, uh, for example, in Hungary, uh, we don't uh, they don't teach prehistory in school. It is one one lecture or two. So if I say people that you know it was in the Bronze Age X Y culture, they don't know about it because why would they know? <clears throat> so you have to uh, put on. Uh, sorry, a uh, map, map where it was, and uh, the numbers from one to, uh, to when it was. And then it's up to you how, how much you want to, uh, how much you want to say about the context. But there are some minimum things you have to end and you can't go into very much detail because they will be too long and they want to read it. So I think we have to find a, find that way that, it, that is good for us and good for the people we would like to reach out. I hope I answered the question. Yes, no, definitely. Sorry, my mute button kept vanishing from me, so I couldn't unmute myself. No, I definitely agree. I find I have a very similar issue when I, especially because I limit myself to one minute of video and then trying to work out what information to put in there is, is very interesting. Um, just while you're still here and while it's still working and before you get too tired, um, I want to ask again as well to Rebecca, because um, you looked at both Instagram and Facebook, I believe, in, in the study uh, that you did. Did you also see a difference between those platforms in terms of, I'm just thinking, for example, Instagram is very visual, so the, the image will be almost more important uh, in maybe in some respects, but on Facebook, you can share lots of other things like embed links and you can do a little bit more things. Did you, did you look at the differences between the platforms as well? Uh, certainly, no. I, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I was uh, uh, doing a little research on Hungarian pages on Facebook and Instagram and uh, how much engagement they get. And the uh, Instagram was much better. I think because a lot of uh, museums are on Facebook but not on Instagram, but they uh, don't really use it the way. So they say they, they can't really uh, engage the people. They get like five likes for a post and have 5,000 uh, followers. So <clears throat> that's not really good, but it's uh, much better. The engagement rates are much better on Instagram uh, because a lot of uh, younger or uh, just most uh, experienced in social media people are doing content there and they don't do that on Facebook because uh, uh, the 
younger, not the youngest because they are on TikTok. <laughs> and I'm, I'm still too old for TikTok. But <clears throat> the people between the TikTok and Facebook are on Instagram. And uh, I think that's the generation that uh, really started uh, doing this in Hungary. So Instagram is uh, doing much better, but I think that Facebook can uh, could really uh, could do really well. But it isn't <laughs> at the moment. It's a lot of page, sadly. Although what is interesting actually is Facebook is very popular, for example, among uh, Inuit populations. They use Facebook for everything, like everyday conversations and everything. So it's it's funny to. Yeah, you, I think uh, it's also, in, for example, in Hungary, it's that way, but it's also interesting to see how it could be different in different cultures. Laura, I see that you're back as well. <laughs> I'm going to come in with a question to you before you vanish again. <laughs> so unfortunately, we missed most of your answer to the last question. So uh, in terms of yeah, live versus pre-recorded, perhaps you could provide a quick summary of your thoughts again. Oh, uh, oh no, we can't hear you now. Oh no, what about now? Oh, now we can. Yes, now you All can. All right. Lulu June in here is playing games with me. See, this is something that I'm very used to because when you do a live session, you need to be resolutive in this sense. And in fact, you can make a brand or a meme out of this because a um, couple of times I've experienced uh, technological issues. And I know that some people really stress about that. And at first I did. But then since I work a lot in the supernatural and I talk about the jinn and the div and the parties and all these kind of creatures around Iranian mythology, I always said that I have a jinn living here with me and they are a playful one. So this, for example, would be if I was on Twitch, it would be like my audience would be patient and waiting for me to be like, ah, no problem. It's like the, the jinn that's always doing things in there. It's like, yeah, sure, definitely. So um, what I wanted, uh, what I was saying before is that you can give in a live session, especially if your audience is comfortable enough to be participative. Participative. I can't speak English. Um, I well, I, it, it's difficult. It's difficult. <laughs> so if your audience is comfortable enough to be participating and engaging, because there's a lot of people that you need to take into account, and they come and they consume your content, but they're shy and they don't feel like part of the community. Although my bach are lovely and are amazing at welcoming new people, you can read the mood. And know when people are not interested and not like people are very quiet and stuff. And I don't know if you got this before the the gin starts playing with my computer. But um, the one of the last streams we did was on Scythian gold and Scythian archaeology. And people were interested in horses and animals because that's something I am interested to. And I, even though I had a chunk of text on something completely different, I said, you know what? If people like to talk about animals. Let's do talk about animals. And you can switch to that. And also something that I love doing. And the main reason I started my Twitch channel in the first place was live reading because people love hearing stories. And what I do is I sit and I read the Book of Kings, which I would love anyone to read about or read it themselves or anything and it's not just a reading there's a commentary so you can just you know of course again you can do this on youtube but you can feel the audience is there and of course you have to be patient and um also there's like designated roles in my in my audience so these people are people that have been with me from the very beginning and they help a lot of the community we have a vizier we have a secretary who have a priestess so it's you bill this this audience, this relationship that I personally have not found in any other platform. I'm not saying that it's not invalid, it's just that works for me. And also avoids me editing, which is something I despise and I'm not good at. So I just click on and show my things. And then like, that, that's, a, um, I think the main advantage and the main difference is that you can really change as you go instead of just doing like a pre-recorded thing if you want to sometimes you don't want to because of the sake of the you know for the sake of the con the content or what you're telling but yeah and um and i love having the opportunity to chat live with the people that are there i think it's just the best thing to be able to have it's like going out with friends or like tiny classes conversation it's, i don't know i'm really happy about that I tried pre-recording things before for pandemic when I was teaching during pandemic. And even with students, if their session was recorded later, it was no problem, but they they kind of still engage a little bit more with the being feeling that you're there 
personally they can they can approach you in a different manner i don't know if that answers your question whatsoever and i'm hoping the gin is gonna be still for 10 minutes hold on so <laughs> no that definitely i think that was good and that's also i think a nice way to show you know you can be more genuine almost and authentic and live compared to pre-recorded because it's harder to be yourself when you're just talking to a screen <laughs> whereas if you're sort of talking to people then i think that's easier as well um i'm also just curious about uh, so you mentioned Twitch and and uh, I, is this something that's mainly watched on a, a computer screen? Can you also access it on your phone? Do you find that you have kind of, okay, so you do have, is this sort of accessible to people in a mobile sense as well? Yeah, it is. And in fact, many people join and they tell you, hey, I'm listening from my phone. And during the pandemic, when we were all looked up, people watch the People watch the streams from the TV and they would send me pictures of it because you can, you know, connect the internet to a TV. And it was it was exactly as watching a program and they were very entertained. Um, now with the situation has changed, I thought that at least this kind of content is like history-based Twitch was gonna have a decline. But I'm still here. <laughs> and so are my friends. And it's not like it's not my main job because I do have a, a different um job occupation professionally I do something else but is it's still there so people enjoy it. and I always say this is going to be here as long as you guys want this to be here because when interest drops I'm just like I've stopped doing it so yeah it's, it's accessible and also you know tablets phones and many people can apparently it's a little bit more intuitive regarding the like chats and emojis and stuff is a little bit better to use the phone so a lot of people choose to use the phone over that because some people when they come to the live program they will listen to it as a podcast my the audience can surprise you in many many ways oh that's great and actually your last point there um uh was about sort of the the pandemic and how that's affected things and how things have happened after that as well and i actually i see that there is a question in the chat and i'll get to that in a second if anyone else has any questions please raise your hand pop them in the chat etc um but i'm curious sort of out to all our speakers how do you think this the pandemic has sort of affected this digital communication that we sort of touched on that in different ways but not just the good ways but also potentially the in bad way or disadvantages of, of what the pandemic has done and and how so researchers museums uh, individuals can kind of mitigate those circumstances perhaps rebecca you would like to go first I uh, think it had a lot of positive uh, influence in Hungary because a lot of uh, institute museum, museum uh, started to make online content only then. So before that they, they don't, but then they started making YouTube videos, which was uh, really great. And they're still out there so people can rewatch it. I also started my blog in the pandemic. And, uh, and I know a lot of other people who started their online business uh, during the pandemic, uh, for example, on Instagram. And you see that it's sort of continuing as well, like there hasn't been a dip, so to speak. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, nice. Uh, Blanche, I'm curious on you. I mean, you you mentioned this a lot in your talk already, but in terms of the kind of post pandemic as we're coming out of it, I mean, how is that being approached by the museums? Is it still on the same sort of uh, momentum? Do you find they're going back to focusing more on physical exhibitions? Yeah, they're definitely going back to physical, but I think there's more of a sense of incorporation, kind of like everyone's work-life balance where you're going between, you know, working from home a little bit, people are more comfortable with that. I think it's kind of a similar way where you're seeing now museums are having options for both. So there's a lot of like, uh, so even the Brooklyn Museum, which I was talking about, you know, they've, they've opened their doors so you can enter the space and have physical contact, but they've also incorporated purely, you know, uh, digitalized or VR um, online exhibitions where you can interact with the like objects, say there was one with garments and outfits and you could sort of turn, as you were sort of talking about before, you could actually like go behind them and turn them around and look at them more. You know, but, but then you also have an option to enter the space. And I think with programming, it's very much the same. So now uh, I know that I was doing some stuff for a, a museum in Australia in Sydney where I live, and it was going to be a physical exhibition. But at the same time, there was 
much more emphasis and focus on how they were going to digitally engage with actually school school groups and you know education in that way so I think it's just encouraged people to be more comfortable with that medium and uh, not just rely on you know the kind of you know what they've always known which is really good yeah I would agree I think that's uh, very nice as well Laura what are your thoughts on this I don't think I have any like because I I'm not I I, I would say it's positive of course the downhill for me is that because people were and, and, I, and I'm quoting from the respect but people were bored so everyone started talking about history archaeology and many of them were not prepared or did not have the tools so that led to a lot of misinformation and this crisscross of channels that overflown uh twitter instagram i don't know about facebook i don't use that one but there was this mass wave of people oh I want to do this as well because I enjoy history it was like that's brilliant but maybe you like in history is not enough and this pandemic environment has affected be like oh but I can do it I'm at home as well I have a mic I have a computer that's not just what it takes but generally speaking I think it's been very positive because it's put on value a different way of approaching and doing things and I don't think one is better than the other but it's different and it's more accessible and um well the memes that were around in Spain when the Museo del Prado opened the TikTok account were gorgeous and great but they they did it very well because they accept they took those memes and turned them into like oh yes we finally are like moving forward because at least in the Spanish um environment sometimes museums and academies too traditional which is not a bad thing but staying too long in there and engaging with new ways of communication especially if you want to direct to a different audience like a younger one for example it's um, difficult so I think I think it's positive overall of course it has its downsides but um yeah just I, I like that they both coexist I do like that yeah, I think, which is similar to what Blanche was saying as well, I think it's just nice that indeed it's a, it's made it more acceptable to have it as an option, which I think is quite a nice thing. I also find with, with for example, online conferences, I mean, there were so many more people who could attend and actually have access to academic scholarship from an archaeological and cultural heritage perspective that they couldn't before. I mean, I had a baby and I couldn't go and see attend conferences but I could do it from my house and so many people were saying oh yeah I, I wouldn't be able to afford to travel from home to a conference but now I can so I think that's uh yeah I would agree I think that's a really good thing uh we have this question here what do you think if we say that Instagram is not as good as TikTok uh as they're following the same steps as TikTok shorts with reels how can we train ourselves with changing the technology and users behavior this is a very interesting question I'm gonna t t give a little answer my thoughts on this um, because indeed, like I say, when I started doing my Instagram content, I was initially just doing posts. I started back in 2018. And then at some point I decided to do reels. I'm not sure why I just thought let's do some video uh, stuff and uh, it seemed to work. But I think that I know, for example, a lot of businesses are kind of struggling, uh, on Instagram, for example, because they're not able to do the reels thing because it just doesn't work with their business for example but I think if you're looking at in res respect of of you as a person trying to engage with people I mean it's like the pandemic and the fact that you know would you then be like oh but before the pandemic we didn't do digital stuff and it didn't you know we didn't need it and it worked perfectly fine so why should we change like with this newfangled technology that people are using and I would feel I would say that that's a pretty good analogy for for example Instagram and TikTok, you know, they're, they're different tools and you reach different audiences through them. So it just depends on what you yourself want to achieve and what your kind of agenda and your aim is, um, I would say. TikTok seems to be, yeah, I've tried TikTok. It's, yeah, <laughs> it, it's a difficult one. Um, I think that, yeah, Instagram still definitely has a certain charm. And I mean, Rebecca was mentioning this a little bit as well before, the fact that, uh, Facebook now is more kind of maybe meant for older gener used by older generations and you know uh, that style of things but then for example if you're wanting to reach an older generation you would use Facebook because that's who you want if you're wanting to reach the 15 year olds who are doing all their dances then you go on TikTok and I know I'm being very general here so I don't want to offend anyone who uses TikTok um but yeah so that's that's my take on it I don't know if any of the other speakers have uh, uh <laughs> you use TikTok 
<laughs> I've tried. I, I, I not as a creator, but I consume TikTok. In fact, that's one of my friends. She's also a divulgadora. Like she does this outreach for me. And it's super fun to see when an audio, I don't know if you, I mean, probably you're familiar with this, but then an audio take goes viral and a lot of creators modify the acting of that audio. And she mm. does this because she focuses on um, women, like artists, women artists from every single part of the world. And she does this with femi feminism take and with the painter's perspective and to speak about art in general. Like the other day she did this hilarious one about uh, Salvador Dalí entering a room and it fits perfectly because she's very good at seeing the opportunity that these audios have and she has an over engagement with younger people that want to study our history or just came across so I, th I think TikTok is fantastic if you know how to use it I just consume mm. it so I leave it to the experts but it's just as you say I think they're different every single platform has its ups and downs and what they like is that there is a type of creator for a type of social media. I possibly wouldn't enjoy TikTok that much and I do not enjoy Instagram, absolutely anything, but I have Twitch. So it's just like, there's there's room for every one of us and we can just do the same things or different in the same universe. I just like when things coexist. Such a lovely view of the world. And I think as well, also, like you said, your friend has, you know, she dedicates a lot of time to thinking, oh, well, what, would, what could go with that audio and, and that kind of thing. So it's just a different way of, working depending on which platform you're on as well which I think is interesting uh, we have another question here from Teresa thank you for all the lovely talks everybody um, if everyone could choose one word reflecting the benefits of digital media for the field of cultural heritage what would it be um, cool that's a tricky question uh, hang on I need to think about my answer <laughs> can it be in another I, language <laughs> yeah <laughs> Sure, we can have a Hungarian one, a Spanish one, an English one. Um, but uh, I think for me, it would be accessibility um, would be the benefit because, yeah, it, it's just opened the world to other people in a way that, yeah, and, and not just cultural heritage, but also the, the curation of cultural heritage. Um, people can see what's actually happening with it, um, which I think is important. Uh, does anyone else want to, to go with their word? Um, you took mine. That was going to be mine as well. But I'll say, um, I just had it and then I forgot. Um, diverse. I think it allows for diversity. Kind of goes with engaging as well, right? Like wider audiences, but yeah. I just Rebecca know. Or Laura, feel free to say it in Hungarian, sorry, or Spanish. I don't know. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm no native speaker, so sorry about that. I don't know if this is a word, but in Spanish it is. So I would say grounded in the sense that sometimes archaeology, history, art history are put up there in this ivory and gold towers that are not accessible, not diverse, or not anything. But then when you take it in, in, um, this digital media, which is super accessible. Everyone has a phone, everyone has a tablet or a computer. You ground things and you return things to where I think they belong, which is, as I said in my intervention, history is not for the academics, it's ours in the better and the more we understand it, the better and the more we would understand each other. So I don't know if it's like a word, but grounded. And, and humble or something like that, like along those lines. I don't know. <laughs> so, no, no, yeah, ground I, is I, worth. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, nice. Very nice. Rebecca, do you, have, do you have one in your head? I feel bad. I feel like we're <laughs> keeping you away. <laughs> uh, mine would be connection. It's like similar to Laura's. So, connecting people to our history, to each other, to ourselves. And, uh, I, I had some really great experiences uh, because I, I usually uh, promote uh, public archaeology to my followers and some of them went to their programs and then wrote me messages that how fun it was and they didn't know about this before. So this was a connection too uh, through a sharing. So connection would be my word. It's a nice uh, mix of words. Uh, well, I think uh, we're probably at the end of time um, and we will need to have a short pause so that people can enter the final uh, Zoom session because I'm just getting up my 
agenda here. Um, so yes, we will have a, a short session break, uh, but hopefully everyone has registered for the closing talk uh, and thanks, which will be happening in sort of five, 10 minutes. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you there and uh, all of our speakers uh, for joining, very much appreciated. And uh, yeah, we will see you all in five to 10 minutes uh, in the closing and thanks session.